the sovereignty of God and what he permits is a thing that the Jews in Paul's day struggled with uh, because their, their, their issue was this. Because we have uh, allowed the Messiah through our uh, unbelief to be uh, executed as it were under the Romans, we were behind all that along with the Romans. Um, does that mean that God is now through with us as a nation? Because we've committed the ultimate crime as it were. And Paul's going to tell them in Romans 9 through 11, uh, God's not done with you. That sinful activity does not trump the plan of God. That God's always sovereignly working through tragedy to accomplish his triumphal purposes. Um, and so that whole sovereignty concept, uh, which is so important to understand as a Christian, that no matter what happens, as we sang about, no matter what happens, um, God takes that and he's weaving it to something awesome that will blow the mind. Uh, and so we want to review, because it's been a few days. You probably have forgotten last Sunday already. Uh, Paul is moving in a diatribe format. So he's like an attorney, and he's using questions that Jews ask, and he's giving answers, and they're all about the sovereignty of God. Did we sin in killing the Messiah to the point where God has now abandoned the nation? And Paul's going to answer that particular question first and foremost. So number one, question number one, this is all review. Does the sin of Israel... Uh, as a nation, abrogate the promises of God? Answer, no. Why? Because God chose them. He doesn't unchoose those whom he's chosen. Uh, number two, uh, second question, uh, do God's precise choices demonstrate that he's unjust? Because Paul said, uh, when God was forming the nation that would be his nation, uh, that he would work in and through to reach the world, he didn't choose everybody in the line of the progenitor. So if you test time, remember we played Bible trivia here at the church. So, um, he didn't choose uh, Ishmael, he chose Isaac. He didn't choose Esau, he chose Jacob. So he could have said, they're all part of Israel. And God said, no, I'm making it very specific. I'm going to winnow it down to select individuals. I'm choosing this brother, not that brother. Now we could say from our, as Westerners, hey, that is totally not fair, right? But, but Paul says, no, it's totally fair because God has his sovereign choices why he does what he does. And so he, they could say, it kind of seems like God's unjust, Paul. Uh, which, question number three, which we talked about last week, is since God chooses one over the other, it looks like he's choosing one to bless and curse the other one. Uh, how can he then hold us accountable? Remember, he used uh, Pharaoh as an illustration. God says, I'm going to harden his heart against Israel, and he's going to be my instrument to bring in the, the exodus, but I'm going to harden his heart. So the, the thing would be, Paul, it seems so unjust. I mean, how can God judge him for something he says he's going to do? Uh, by way of review, God has his sovereign will that he's, he's executing in his dimensionality. In our dimensionality, we have free will to choose. How the two go together, no man, and I've read all the stuff and, and listened to some of the best professors, no human mind can connect the two effectively. You're always going to have, how does that work? Well, you, it appears on a given day that you have free will, doesn't it? How many are going out to lunch afterwards? Yeah. Are you going to have choices when the menu is given to you? Or you just look at your husband and go, it's predetermined. It's a Big Mac. <laughs> no, you have choices. You have choices. Uh, and, and, but God has his plan. You're not going to trump his plan. And so God's going to tell us, as he told Paul, uh, as he articulated that question, Pharaoh's responsible for what Pharaoh did to Israel. Yes, he accomplished my plan, but he, his heart was hard even before I hardened it because he was born in sin. That's going to lead to question number four, which is what I want to talk about. Uh, question number four, and it relates to this sovereignty of God. Here's the next question in the light of Pharaoh being used by God. The question, hey, Paul, if God is just, as you say he's just, why does he react slowly to sin? See what I mean? I mean, don't you think that he would have, should have stopped the, the shooter in San Diego? I mean, somewhere along the line, melted his weapon or something? Uh, I think the gun did jam, did it not? I think so. Uh, but, but why does he take his time? I mean, don't you ever feel like when you're looking at sin as it devolves in our culture, don't you feel like if you were God, you would move quicker? Like, I would just step in and vaporize them, God. <laughs> don't you feel like this? Or am I just talking to myself? Yeah, and, and so this is the question. If God, is, if, if God is really just, why is he slow? Why does he speed things up? Remember how God tells time. A day with God is how long? A thousand years, and a thousand years to him is a day. So he does not move fast from our perspective, but from his, his blitzkrieg speed. 
And so Paul says, Let, listen, let's answer that particular question uh, in light of God using Pharaoh, and it took him a while to get there. Uh, he's going to answer that in a, in, with two answers, not just one, but two. Uh, so let's read what he says to, to the would-be questioner. Uh, he says, let's, let's think of a scenario. It's a conditional sentence. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, suppose God endured with much patience um, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Suppose he did that. And then he says, and, he, and then he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, uh, Christians, which he prepared beforehand for glory. And then Paul says, let me identify who that is in verse 24. Even us, whom he also called, uh, not from among the Jews only. He didn't, he didn't just call Jews to be objects of blessing, but he also called from among the Gentiles. Now, this is a very complicated uh, section of Scripture. I mean, I will not lie to you. It's very complicated because what it is, it's a conditional statement with an if clause that's a long if clause and no then clause. So you, you follow me? So if you talk with somebody and you say, if you do X, Y, Z, they're looking for, and then... So if you're in an airplane on a static line and there's a whole bunch of people, but how many Army Airborne are actually here? They're here. They're so quiet. You're on that static line and you're going out. What's happening when you go out that door with the static line? What's happening to your chute? You're hoping it deploys correctly. And it, it just cause effect. So if you go out and, and don't hold on to the door and have somebody boot you out or you're holding on, but you actually go out, it, it gets pulled and, you, and then there's probably a great jerking motion as the air fills your chute. Uh, I can just imagine. And then you're deployed, right? Uh, if then, Paul doesn't give you the then, which makes you, if you're a thinking person, do what? Ask, uh, hey, Paul, what, what up with the then part of the sentence? I mean, at least for me. Uh, and, and, and he basically, I think Paul leaves it out to, to tell you, you're smart enough to figure out what the then is. If God allows all these things to happen, uh, the then part is, well, he does these things because he's sovereign and he's accomplishing great goals. So just trust them. Just trust them. Fill that in. So what does he say here? Well, answer number one, why God moves slowly where sin is concerned. Uh, verses 22 to 23. Uh, first answer is he has what? Purposes, plural, singular, plural. He has more than one purpose. Uh, here he's going to tell you, my, my purposes are twofold uh, when it comes to dealing with sin. And, it, and I do move slowly, but I have purposes in that. So purpose number one concerns the lost or non-Christians. Verse 22, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? What does that mean? I mean, don't you find that kind of an enigmatic, cryptic statement? What is he talking about? Don't you ever read your Bible and go, I don't have an idea what he just said there. Uh, happens to me, but then I have to get up and talk about it. So <laughs> scary. Uh, yeah. So here, here, here's what he's saying, and I'll, I'll break it down this way. Um, he says, suppose God, um, suppose God takes people who are lost and sets up a scenario so where they can understand his wrath and his power, but he takes his time. Is that just? I mean, here's the way it works. If God moved quickly in sinful situations, quickly with us, just vaporized him here, nuked him, whatever God would do, suppose he just did that quickly, then the lost could say, he is not just. He didn't give me a chance. God's like, okay, I'm gonna give you plenty of time to consider me. So that when I do move in wrath and I do move in power, then you cannot say in eternity when I judge you, you weren't just, I didn't have time. Uh, let's analyze this. He says, he, God wants to demonstrate to the lost two things. And they're denoted, you can't see it in the English text, but see the word to demonstrate, see that? That's an infinitive. It's a purpose use of an infinitive. So his first purpose is God wants to demonstrate in slow situations. He wants to demonstrate something off the grid for us as Westerners. What's the first thing he wants to demonstrate? Wrath. You have an issue with that? I mean, all the week I've been thinking about it. If I was God, I would be thinking the very first thing I'd want them to know is, I'm loving, kind, compassionate, merciful, etc. What's he say? No. When God's moving slowly dealing with sin and sinners, uh, he does so so that one day when the hammer does fall and there is divine wrath, they see it most clearly, the wrath of God, because they've challenged that by their lifestyle. And it's not just a wrath, it is the wrath with an article in the Greek text. This is eschatological, end of the time, second coming of Jesus, that wrath, when they see it. 
Uh, Paul uh, talks about this sovereign wrath of God uh, all through his writings. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, if you have your Bible, what's he say? He says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, what's happening when you reject God, reject the proof of God, and reject the Messiah? You just merely make deposits into the bank of wrath. One day, they can't fit anymore in your vault. And God then says, the day of compassion and mercy are over. It's now time for wrath. That's what he does. If you truly believed, if they truly believed in D.C., like I'm speaking of our politicians, that everything that they said, thought, did, etc., was under the watchful eye of God Almighty, and that one day they'd stand toe-to-toe -to -toe before him and be judged by him, don't you think that would alter their activity in a given week? There'd be no news. See, God is sovereign. One day the wrath comes and the world lives as if there's no wrath coming. Uh, no, he says, I, I, I'm going to slowly set up a situation through the evil that you see in society that one day when I come in wrath and judgment, they will understand most certainly that my, my wrath and judgment is just, not unjust. Now let's go to, let's think about Pharaoh because he's the core of the context, Pharaoh. So God used Pharaoh in the sin of Pharaoh to reach out to, to show his greatness uh, through delivering the Israelites. So the Egyptian empire, you had the old kingdom period of the Egyptian empire. That uh, started in 2649 BC. But Pharaoh Amenhotep II, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, he didn't come around until 1450 BC. So for 1,203 years, God looked at the Egyptian empire and said, I'm going to be merciful and compassionate through general revelation and see if you'll use general revelation to pursue special revelation. Who'd they end up worshiping? <laughs> well, the general revelation, the moon, the stars, the, every, the scarab beetle, the Nile River. They worship everything but the God of the creation. So that in 1,203 years, when God finally brought judgment against the empire by bringing his uh, plague judgments against them, they saw his wrath None could say when God judged them, your wrath is not just. God could say, no, I gave you 1,203 years to repent. Think about your own life. I mean, why is God taking his time when you continually reject him over, over, over? He's being merciful and kind. He wants you to come to repentance. But one day he says, doors closed. Like when they closed the ark door, doors closed. See, today's the day of repentance. So God wants to show his wrath uh, to show that it was justified. The second thing he says he wants to show is his what? Power? His power. What kind of power? Well, his unlimited power. Um, I think all the soldiers that I, that I saw this week all live in the gym. I mean, they either, whatever they do, and then they go to the gym all day. That's the way they physically looked to me. It's like, wow, this is amazing. And they also told me that their base was the center of the universe. <laughs> I'm like, it is? I thought it was Jerusalem. No, it's Fort Bragg in Fayetteville. I'm like, oh, <laughs> most instructive, um, most interesting. Um, when you look at uh, the, the power, we can work out and do all we do, but we've got to replenish our power because our, our, our power is limited. Not so with God. So when he, he could create the entire cosmos from just speaking into existence, and the, the, the power released to do that doesn't diminish his power. He has power. So what they want to show the lost? That he has total power when he comes in wrath. And when he does it, no one can say his use of power was unjust. Think about it. Uh, the, the Egyptians were judged by God in many different ways to show the power of God. So when God sent the plague of darkness, it says it was thick darkness. Have you ever been in a cave? Deep down in the earth, I have. Um, what was the name of that cave in Arizona that we went to when I was a kid? It's great to have your mother here. I'm your son. Do you remember me? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a cave, cave east of Tucson. Um, and and we, I went down as a kid with my parents, 800 feet down, never been in a cave. Got down to the bottom of the cave where the Army Corps of Engineers quit putting little light bulbs on the wall. And we got down to this chasm. There was a railing there and a chasm. I was a little kid dropping rocks in there. Never heard them hit. It was really scary. It was like, I would not want to go in there. And then we're standing there, and the tour guide's like, well, at this point right now, we're going to turn off all the lights. Oh, no, 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 no. No, he turned off the lights. You know when you go into a movie and you're, you're late, and you don't want to, have you ever sat on somebody? 
I, 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 I've actually done that. There's a lady sitting there, sir. You know, anyway. So it's always good to let the rods, the cones, like kind of adjust in your eyes and then sit down with your popcorn. Not like me just blazing in and sitting down. But anyway, so the guy turns the lights out. Do you remember that? When they turn the lights out, your rods and cones never adjusted. It was pitch black, pitch black. And I'm like, where's that railing in that chasm? You know, you know, I mean, dark as dark can be. They, they lit a lot, uh, one match, one match lit up the entire cavern. And I, I'm a, I was like 12 years old. I'm like, that's like the gospel of God, isn't it? Whole nother sermon. But um, when, when, you, when you think about God's, God's power, his power is, un, is, is unlimited. His power is, is, is unleashed. It, it defeats darkness. And so when he says, when I bring my power to judgment, he says, I'm going to take the Egyptian empire that worships the sun god in four formats. They used uh, the sun god for the god Ray, uh, the god Aten, the god Atum, and the god Horus, all associated with sun worship. And God says to the Egyptians, I'm going to turn off the sun for you in the middle of the day so you cannot see. It's going to be thick darkness. But he did something amazing if you read the context. In every Jewish home, there was light. What, did he go to Safeway, buy candles before the fact? I mean, did God say, hey, get some candles and get red? No, no. He said, I'm going to turn off the lights in the Egyptian empire, but in your home, there's going to be astral light there that I'm going to put there so you can see. Could you imagine if you were an Egyptian? Hey, what's up with all the Israelite homes? There's a power outage here in the entire country, but their homes have light. Where is that coming from? See, this is the power of God. Did it make the Egyptians turn to God? No. No, but God said, I'm going to show you my power. God takes his time in judgment to show the godless his power, that it's just when it's revealed. The second thing that he does concerns the saved. That's the lost. Second thing God does, he takes his time in bringing judgment because he wants to show the saved something. So what's he want to show us? What's Paul say? And he did so in order that, uh, the purpose, uh, is so that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, Christians, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Don't you like the word glory? Uh, glory. Why is God taking his time uh, to bring about justice? Well, he wants to set the stage so that when you see his glory, there will be no doubt that it is spectacular and awesome. My mom's sister, my Aunt Roberta, uh, who went home to be with Christ when she was, what, 52 52, long battle with breast cancer, godly woman. Uh, she, she was very wealthy, uh, and so she, she went to go buy a diamond one time in San Francisco. She told me, and I said, well, what's it like when you just go buy a loose diamond like that? I mean, not that I have that kind of money. Not now, <laughs> not ever. And she said, well, it was awesome. She went into the jewelry store, laid down a big piece of black velvet, and he poured these beautiful diamonds on it for me to choose from. And she said they had these really nice lights trained on the diamonds, so when they poured them out on the black velvet, bing, they just popped. And I thought to myself as I'm listening to her, this is a theological statement from a jewelry store. Because isn't this what God does? He takes the blackness of judgment, sin, and he showcases his glory against that. I mean, how do I know that? Well, if you read Matthew 24, Jesus says when he comes back with the angels, he comes in glory. And if you read Revelation chapter 19, read it, it's going to tell you that when he comes back, he turns off the luminaries. He makes it dark. Why? So that when he breaks into our dimensionality from his dimensionality, the brightness of his presence will blind people. It will be so awesome. They will see who he is. What does glory mean? I mean, really? Uh, are you holding on to your seat? We're going to take a very fast tour and a very fast ride. Ready? What is the glory about? He said he wants to prepare us for glory. Well, number one, it means the brightness of God's presence. So if you took all of the stars and all of the known cosmos and galaxies and put all that luminosity together, since he made them, they're but a faint reflection of his glory. And you're wondering, well, okay, what am I going to do in heaven all day? Sounds boring. <laughs> do you, are you kidding me? Are you thinking you're going to be walking around your first day of heaven going, well, it's an amazing street. You know, it's, I don't know, it's kind of floating in the air. It's kind of gold. You can see through it. It's translucent. That's amazing. What else is there? No. You're going to see the glory of God. It's, a, it's a, the brightest light you'll ever see will emanate from his presence. Uh, it has to be shielded from man's naked eyes or it will consume you. It's like a devouring fire because that's what it was on Mount Sinai. It sanctifies unsanctified ground when it appears. It fills God's tabernacle, his temple. It will one day fill the earth. 
It can be shockingly resisted by the godless when they see it. You would think if you saw the glory of God Almighty, you would repent and convert immediately. But not so when you read the book of Numbers. It appears to bring judgment against false rulers. Its brilliance is, uh, is seen in the heavens as you look at the sun. Since he made it, it's a, merely a, a shadow of his greatness. Uh, it, uh, it's the light of the heavenly city of Jerusalem because there's no sun there. Because the sun, S-O-N, Jesus is there. Uh, it is an amazing thing to behold. Revelation 4 explains it to you if you go read it. Uh, it's given uh, as light to saints. Uh, it's transformative now as you look into the face of Christ and try to conform your life to him. You're being changed from glory to glory. You're becoming more like him. Uh, it's the epicenter of Christ on his throne, according to Isaiah 6. It's, it will be the light for all of eternity when the world and the cosmos as we know it is gone. Um, it, will, it calls by definition for man to worship God. Uh, it will descend upon the earth in judgment, Matthew 25. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, your body as a Christian will pulsate with it when you see God. Remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai? What did they tell him about his face? Hey, Moses, have you considered your face? I mean, was he up there just a whole bunch of amounts of oil of olay? <laughs> yeah. His 80-something-year-old face is now not weather-beaten. It's tight skin. And, no, no. He came down, and they couldn't even look at him because his face was, what? Glowing. What's that tell you? Extrapolate. Follow the trajectory. If he was glowing, when you see God first day in heaven, you're going to be glowing because your body will emanate. Did you ever buy those things as a kid, and you'd stick them underneath the lamp from the fair, whatever, and then they pick up the light, and you turn the lights off as kids and go, whoa, check it out. Am I dating myself? They don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the room uh, of the house that we purchased, uh, the, the whole room was, was uh, uh, wallpaper of uh, outer space. And uh, it had been on there for 30 years. And all on the ceiling of the room of the, of the young kid um, were uh, planets glued to the ceiling. That was awesome to take all that down. But <laughs> if you turn the lights off in that room, uh, and you could kind of sit there on the bed, you could like, woo. Yeah, yeah it's, this is you in God's presence. You're emanating his glory. Uh, Paul says what God does is he takes his time in bringing judgment so that when you see the glory, man, they ain't nothing like it. He's taking his time. Answer number two, why God's slow in, in uh, developing his plans, uh, his purposes. Well, God, he says he has specific plans that he's working on. Uh, specific plans for who? Well, for two people groups. Number one, for Gentiles me, and if you're a Jewish person, for you too. And then he has another plan for Gentiles, as we'll talk, or Jew, Jews, as we'll talk about. He's going to quote from the Old Testament, book of Hosea, to validate the point that God always has plans. It just takes him a while to develop them. Verse 24, he says, uh, uh, even us whom he has called, not only from the Jews, uh, but also from the Gentiles. And then he says, let me, let me quote from Hosea. He says, as he also says in Hosea, quote, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and I, her who is not my beloved, I'll call her my beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it is said of them, you're not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Uh, if you go back to the book of Hosea, uh, he's quoting here from Hosea chapter 2 and Hosea chapter 1. And he says, well, let's go back to Hosea, and he's, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, I want us to go back there, and I'm going to quote something to you, and I'm going to apply this that was for Israel to the Gentiles. But it doesn't mean that he's done with the Jews, but let, I want to apply it to the Gentiles. So what's he say? So the prophet Isaiah, or prophet Hosea, had a, he, he didn't have a wife, so God told him to go marry Gomer. What was her occupation? Prostitute. Prostitute. If you're a godly man and God says, go do this, what's the first response? No. I mean, are you kidding me? But he did it. So he went and he married. Why did he marry her? Because God says, I want your marriage relationship to illustrate my relationship with Israel, my wife. I'm faithful to them as you are as a prophet, and they are like a harlot worshiping anybody and everything other than me. And so he says that when you marry her, I want you to have children. So they have two sons and they have a daughter. So the first son is named Jezreel, and then and they have great meanings to these names that they pick. And he, he says, uh, I want you to name them extremely meaningful names that will illustrate our strained relationship. So they have a, a daughter, and they name her, and the, the word lo in Hebrew means no or not. So he says, I want you to name your daughter, Hosea chapter 1, verse 6, lo ruhama, which means every time you say her name, 
Her name means in Hebrew, she's not loved. Imagine. She comes to you and says, Dad, why'd you give me this name? Well, honey, because your name's supposed to represent to the nation that because of the sin of the nation of the 10 tribes that broke away from the two tribes, it, it's, it, your godlessness is, your life's an illustration that it's like God doesn't love you anymore because you've abandoned him. And then, uh, why did you name my little brother Loami? Well, because that means you're not my people. Wow, imagine these names. Uh, and w applied to Israel, uh, God says, your sin has so separated between me and you uh, it's as if I don't love you, but I do. And it's as if you're not my people, but it's only temporary. How do we know it's temporary? Uh, because Hosea chapter 1 verse 10, from where he quotes, to chapter 2 verse 1 of Hosea, uh, the prophet comes along and says, God shall not forget those 10 tribes forever. He will eventually call them who were not my people, my people. But Paul says, I want to take it and apply it to Gentiles. Because the Gentiles weren't the people of God and Paul says, God had a plan in the orchestration of the complexity of history to take the tragedy of the cross and sovereignly use it to reach Gentiles. Why did he do that? Because all throughout the Old Testament, if anybody pays attention, God said he was going to reach Gentiles. Genesis 12, 3, he told Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. Through you, the world will be blessed. See, through the cross of Christ, the tragedy of the cross, Paul said God called Gentiles to be part of his family. Does that mean that God's done with uh, Israel as a nation? Nope. No. So Paul comes back to that and closes with that argument. Verse 27. God has plans for Israel. It just takes him a long time to orchestrate those sovereign plans. Verse 27. He says, I'm going to quote here from Isaiah. It says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it's a remnant that will be saved, for the Lord will execute his word upon the earth thoroughly and quickly when he does it. Uh, and just as Isaiah foretold, quote, except the Lord Sabaoth, which uh, uh, is, the, is the word for armies in Hebrew, um, the Lord of armies, uh, had left to us a prosperity, if he wouldn't have saved a remnant, he said we, we'd have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. Because when God nuked Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, those four cities, there was no one left. And he said, you know, God's plan for Israel is he's not done with them. It's just taking him thousands of years to redeem them as a nation. But he says to them, as he quotes from Isaiah, it's not as if God's going to save the entire nation when he appears. No, he's going to save a remnant. He's always had a remnant. If you go back and you read Zechariah chapter 12 and 13, Zechariah 12 tells you that uh, the world focus will be Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah. I think that's fulfilled. And then keep reading chapter 12 and 13 because when Christ comes back, those who are alive at that time see him in his glory when he comes. The remnant turns to him. But the majority of the nation does not. But it's from that he has a new nation that loves him and follows him. God's still orchestrating that plan through all the triumphs and tragedies of the Israelite people today. God's still working through all of that to bring them to himself. It just takes him a while to do it. I don't know about you, but I am glad God's hand is on the wheel. Because sometimes I look around at my old world and I think, it's spinning out of control. That's my carnal man. Then the godly man steps in and goes, oh no, God's totally orchestrating his plan to bring his kingdom to bear so all men will fall before him and call Christ king. I'm looking to that day. Uh, glory is, well, is coming. You gonna be there when he comes for you? Let's pray. God, thank you just for your sovereign plan for our lives. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're lost out in the desert and things are happening. It's out of control and we're frustrated, we're anxious, we're nervous. Help us to rest in the fact that your sovereignty is intricate down to the smallest of little details and you're going to fulfill your plan despite the, the evil and the twisted nature of man. Nothing shall trump your purposes that you've designed in Scripture. We give you praise for your greatness in Christ's name. Amen.